Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here tonight with Bruce. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Uh, I have a cold Mm -hmm. on a very cold night. So it is cold. It's very cold. Did you get that emergency alert to shut off all your power? Sure did. Do you think our podcast qualifies, Bruce, as essential? Uh, well, some people seem to think so, so let's go with that. <laughs> it, it's uh, it's probably not using a whole lot of power. I'm using LEDs in here. and uh, There you go. Anyway, uh, it's... Uh, uh, I saw a readout of the power usage, and it took a, it was way high, sky high, and it took a good sharp dive, presumably right after that warning went out, because it was going up, 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 and then you're back down, part way Every, down. But everyone every, went around and turned off all their lights in their unnecessaries. houses. Unnecessaries. Maybe a few people even unplugged their Teslas or something like that. Well. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, Bruce, this is our. Two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast on the owner's historic winning streak. Yes. Ten, ten games in a row. Ten. Ten. That is damn good. That is damn good. Ten games in a row. And um, astonishing. So uh, it was a two-to-one overtime victory over the Canadien of Montreal. Um, a team with a shocking number of no-name players. Maybe if you're in Montreal, you know the names, but for me, there was like mm-hmm. six, seven guys I had never heard of. I'll give you a few examples here. Um, let's find the uh, event summary. Okay. Um, Joshua. Mitchell, Mitchell Stevens. Mm-hmm. Um, Jonathan oh, Kovacevic. Yeah, I had heard his Jaden Struble. Okay, Raphael Harvey Pennard, Michael Pizzetta. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I've heard of Yessi Alonen, mm-hmm. but I, you know, I wouldn't be completely sure. So there's Joshua Wa. Yeah, I Joshua Wa. <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah, Montreal. But you know what, Bruce? They've got some defensemen who can really play. You know, it's like, with, uh, it's like yeah, Winnipeg with it's like Winnipeg with Demello and Morrissey, these mm-hmm. guys that are not really huge reputation, but they can really defend. They're such great skaters, and both Gooley and Mike Matheson are in that category. Wow, wow. Pittsburgh uh, did they trade him for Petrie? Is that was was that the trade? Yeah, he moved like, around a bit. Florida had him. And uh, uh, he wound up getting swapped. Maybe it was Petrie. That sounds... Uh, I know Petrie went from Montreal to Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, it was... Uh, uh, he was a guy... He signed like an eight-year contract when he ah. was in Florida for like re- reasonable dollars, <clears throat> like $4 million. And he was still pretty unproven. And people were going, what are you doing? And then he struggled for a year or two, and people were really going, what are you doing? And then they traded him, and now he's emerged and emerging. And I've got him in my pool, so I watch this guy a little bit, and he can really skate and play. And he had an absolutely tremendous game tonight, named second star behind Sam Montembeau in the home arena. Yeah. Uh, and he, But he was the one sitting in the penalty box when the game-winning goal was scored, so kind of a bitter Ending for uh, Mike Matheson, but oh well. To hell with him. <laughs> He's on the wrong team. Hey, at least <clears> he <throat> got a point on their goal. So <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, you you can only give the Oilers so many power plays. They what was that their fourth? So that was their fifth in overtime. Fifth. Wow. They didn't have any until late in the second period. And Montreal's power plays, or Edmonton's power plays, the first one uh, was at 12 minutes of the second. And then they had, of course, they got the uh, game delay uh, for um, uh, challenging. Uh, that was like which, a terrible, which the refs terrible even challenge. Quickly. What a bad and, idea that was. And then they what took, was he thinking? 
Yeah, and then they took a penalty, uh, interference penalty on McDavid behind the play, and then Gallagher got one for hooking Cody Cece of all people with 149 in regulation. That's uh, but Oilers still couldn't score, and then Matheson high stick nurse early in overtime, allegedly. And uh, Nurse <laughs> Terminator, it looked like he got high stick and the ref uh, bought it. That's, I haven't seen for sure whether the stick actually caught him or not. I don't see Nurse as a diver, but sometimes you have to play well, the situation. He, and the refs were biting hard in the third period. So uh, they might as well uh, see, what, see what's what. And so he wound up in the box. And finally, four on three after the power play had just gone fail, fail, fail at five on four. I couldn't even get any shots through. It didn't seem like, but the, anyway. the Montreal Canadiens were getting a stick on everything. The Oilers had not one um, five alarm shot on the power play, including oh. the winning goal. So in total, Edmonton had fourteen grade A shots to Montreal's seven. Mm-hmm. And when it came to the subset of five alarm shots, the truly dangerous shots in a game, Edmonton had five and Montreal had four. So it was a very low event game in terms of um, great scoring chances. But um, and Montre- Edmonton had way more than Montreal overall. But um, they had none in the first period. Not in the first period. Bruce, um, what is your good thing? Yeah. Uh, what is my good thing? I guess I'm going to go with uh, uh, Edmonton's, I thought, terrific push in the third period. Uh, after, like this game, there was seven grade eight shots total between the two teams through 40 minutes. <clears throat> and then there was eight in the first four minutes of the third period. The game just went up to another level. And then the Oilers just gradually seized more and more control over it. Like, they weren't fully in control. And they easily could have gone sideways with, you know, one play. Uh, but it was them that was pushing hard uh, down the stretch and... Uh, uh, throughout the third period and out shooting Montreal 19 to 8 and managing to stuff one shot through Montembeau and about two inches over the goal line, which was all they got. And then, and of course, tearing through in the overtime, that Bouchard shot that uh, hit the post, hit Montembeau in the butt and bounced back into the net. What a tough way for the first star to bow out of this game, too. All the second star watches from the penalty box. But those guys both played great, and I don't begrudge them. The, uh, if I was a home star picker, I would have picked the same two guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the third period, the uh, the Oilers did come on significantly. And um, there is, you know, Skinner just made one absolutely fantastic save. Mm-hmm. Um on the um, Montreal had a power play. Yeah, did they and, ever. Um, Ekholm, for some reason, there's already a defenseman in the corner, and Ekholm says, I'm going to wander over there too. You know, why mm-hmm. not? And we quickly find out why not, because he, to cover for him, Derek Ryan has to rotate down. And then um, no a guy, guy coming around the end, and the slot is wide open, and a pass comes out because Ryan can't bat it down. And Nugent Hopkins hasn't been able to ro- rotate way over in time. And um, an absolutely wicked blast from Cole Caulfield, I believe it was. Who can really fire <clears throat> it? And it was right inside the post. And Skinner, uh, you know, he had to go post to post because the pass came out on his glove side post. And then the rocket was right inside the stick side. And he got his blocker on it. I nearly picked Skinner as my good thing, but I've done it so many times lately. That's. Maybe time to just give the team as a whole credit for buckling down. It felt like this was might be the one where it was just going to come to an end, you know, and because Montreal was just so tenacious in this game. And they really such, were. Such a weird team. Like their last game on Thursday night, Montreal lost at home to San Jose, who had lost 12 straight, all in regulation. And then they beat the halves. And I, I was thinking all day, I wouldn't it just be just like them to turn it around and beat the team on a nine-game winning streak in their next game. And they gave it everything they had, like full credit to Montreal, who was not a good, as good a team as Edmonton. But they just hung around. And uh, Edmonton had to buckle down to hang around with them and finally, finally uh, find a way to uh, for the happy, happy ending. 
the owners were trying to beat them with skill in this game. And when you're getting outworked, that's kind of hard to do because, um, they, yeah, Montreal was just buzzing, 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 defending like crazy. And they, they can skate. They're not, they don't seem like a slow team. And, uh, they, so they kept up with the Oilers and, um, that was, it was a very effective strategy and Edmonton just couldn't break through. My good thing is when they finally did break through mm-hmm. and, and it's from a player who has been outstanding this year, Warren Fogle. And, um, you know, it's a slow burn in terms of Edmonton's love affair with Warren Fogle. Yes. Some people will never forgive Warren Fogel because he was traded for Ethan Bear, who was a real fan favorite with many. And um, oh, there was fault. not Warren Fogel's Blame fault. Blame the GM. Blame the GM or give or, the GM or, or. credit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean they, <clears throat> the, the GM here took a while for Warren they Fogel did to get develop. a good player out of it. First, he's developed into a bona fide top six winger in the NHL. He's a, he's an, he's a really strong uh, partner for dry subtle right now. Mm-hmm. He's, he's hustling like crazy, winning pucks everywhere, making moves with the puck, making plays with the puck that he didn't make in his first couple of years here. He's really playing well. The only thing he doesn't have a lot of is points, mm-hmm. but he's starting to get some points too. They're starting to come. And tonight, um, Again, it's early in the third period. The orders have got to come back. This is a team they should beat. Because whatever else you want to say about their winning streak, the orders are, <laughs> this is tonight. Tonight's the first time they're at, in sole possession of a wild card spot. They've been tied in terms of points. And I don't even, I haven't even checked the standings yet. Maybe they will be at the end of the night again tied. <clears throat> but the orders can't afford to lose tonight's game. They're still in a, mm-hmm. in a fight oh, for right. the final playoff spot. That's the reality of their situation. Um, this is a game they desperately needed to win. It doesn't feel like that because they've been winning, 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 but they've got to win. So what does Warren Fogel do? He's the, he's, he starts playing with a necessary desperation, which had been lacking from many other players this game. He just barged in there. He um, it's, uh, wins the puck in the corner and uh, takes it to the net, makes a nice move, takes it to the net. Puck protects, takes it to the net, and uh, this jams it on net, and the puck's sitting there loose, not covered, on top of the skate of goalie Montembeau, Lord Montembeau, and um, Drysaddle slams it home, uh, goes goes for the net, sees it's not covered, and jams it in. So, um, yeah, it starts off with Kane and Fogel behind the net actually winning the, the puck, I believe, on the other side. And Fogel brings it around and takes it out and then drives it, jams it in. Wasn't his last good play, though. He was involved in, he hit the post, he charged he into, did. charged in, hit the post. He was in, in, involved in another play where um looked like Kane uh, tipped Nurse's outside shot on net. Fogel got the rebound and put it back out and Kane then put it back at the goalie. Now, Warren Fogel... It, he that was a hell of a trade for the Oilers in the end. It, it he's with the Oilers. Ethan Bear is not with the team that he was traded to. Um, Fogel has become developed into what the Oilers hoped he would. Um, you know they were hoping he would be a really good third line forward. Well, he's developed into a really good second line forward, and. Drysdale and him at this point are inseparable. They still haven't found the third guy, I don't think, and we're going we're going to get it's to that. It's been McLeod, but <clears throat> yeah, we'll get to that in a bit. But um, Fogel's the second guy. He's with Drysdale, and that's not going to change, I don't think. Bruce, what's no, your not back? In a, not any oh, time ahead. soon. It's not going to change anytime soon. Uh, my bad thing's going to be the the slow start to the game, and uh, this was. Uh, you know, very first minute, uh, uh, Newton Hopkins takes a pretty unnecessary penalty uh, along the wall in his own yeah. zone, and he goes off. And of course, he's basically Edmonton's top penalty killer, sitting in the box. And so the PK comes out that's killed off 19 in a row here. So I don't want to be too critical, uh, but they lost the draw, and then they just couldn't ever clear the puck out. I think it was about a one minute long sequence and they just weren't able to uh, ever win a puck battle decisively enough to 
to get it down. And uh, Montreal just cycled, cycled, cycled. And, uh, eventually it wound up with a, a, somebody blew coverage somehow and there was a, just a wide open whole net to shoot at for Cole Caulfield. First shot of the game for Montreal. Boom, one nothing, And stayed one nothing for a very long time. And to Stu Skinner's credit, he let the first one in and then he stopped all the rest, which was 23 shots after that. So uh, he's... Uh, continues to cook with gas, but it just seemed like Edmonton was second best to it, and not just the first two minutes, but the whole first 20 minutes, where they they never got really, well, by our count, zero grade A shots, a couple of borderline ones that, you know, weren't what you wanted. Uh, you know, Montreal seemed to be getting a stick on it, and like, full credit to the opponent again. Like, the, the, the teams playing the Oilers are bringing it in terms of... Uh, doing their best to shut them down but yeah i didn't um montreal on that power play that first power play mm-hmm. they just got every bounce and it happened again on a later power play where they where the others were knocking it off their stick and, and they did never go first power play, and it was never go to them it would just keep going back to the montreal players it was so frustrating <laughs> and then uh on the the goal i think leon got a little too out towards the blue line and they passed it around him. Then it's a four on three down low and Ryan was unable to cut out the crossing pass. So boom, you know, they had been out that minute. They were both tired by then, Yes, but there was all four tired. Yeah. They, that's going to happen when you're tired like that, but they survived the second time it happened. Fortunately, minute 38, it was finally, (laughs) there was 22 seconds left on the penalty when they finally cleared the zone and, 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 and glided thankfully to the bench. They finally got, they got it all the way down so they could change all hands, and they were just sucking wind at that point on that one and yeah. third period. That was a long two minutes as a fan watching that. I felt pretty pretty uncertain that Edmonton was going to be able to kill that one off. But uh, That was the second the time done. it happened, right? Yes, the, the second one, that yeah. That was in the third period. Midway in the third period, yeah. yeah. The time, it, it was Fogel. That was in the box for a tripping penalty where his skate caught the other oh, guy. Yeah. And, and so, not an ideal time, 10 minutes left in a 1-1 game, but uh, the PK got her done that time, and they went, uh, they killed three out of four tonight. So, their perfect run is over, but, uh, they've, you know, 22 out of the last 23 is pretty good. Yeah. So my back check, not my back check, my bad thing. I'm going to bring up a back check here in a second. It, it, it's not, I, I'm tempted to talk about this play by Evan Bouchard in the third period. I'm going to talk about it. It's not my bad thing, though. It was both. We, we saw the, the good and the bad of Evan Bouchard in that same shift. Because later in the same shift, he wins a battle on the boards. Mm-hmm. And um, I think he sent, who oh. did he send? Fogel, Fogel on, on the, the two-on-one. That hit the That's post. right. Yeah, Fogel. It was a great play. He makes a great pass. That's Evan Bouchard. But there yeah. is a yeah, after he got there's the a bunch of rolling off. I'm, yeah, the two chances were seven seconds apart. One, one for Montreal off a Bouchard turnover, and one for Edmonton off a great Bouchard outlet pass. Seven seconds later, what was that? Yeah, Bouchard. He he was. It was a two-on-one rush, but Bouchard came back and had the guy almost covered. Oh, he caught yeah. up to him. He caught up to him, and then he did the slack check, Bruce. The dreadful, the, the most Dread. dreadful of all mm-hmm. uh, defensive hockey ph- uh, phenomenon, the slack check, where you skate back hard, hard as you can, and you catch up to the other player, just about, just mm-hmm. about catch up. You could catch up if you just took one more stride, but you stop skating. He stopped skating, and he allowed the Montreal player then to get in there. And we see that, so it's just this common occurrence in the NHL. And uh, that was a great example of the slack check right there. If you if you want to go on your replay, it's at 17.49 of the third period. But, of course, he came back and made the great stretch pass, and he scored the winning goal on an f- absolutely dynamite shot. He's mm-hmm. got 10 uh, goals and 30 assists now, Bruce, in 39 games. Evan Bouchard, quite a hockey player. Only Oiler not named Paul Coffey. They were saying to get 40 points before 40 games as a D-man. 
Yeah, he's having Tough, himself. Tough did it six times. <laughs> he's having yeah. himself quite a year. That was a Paul Coffey kind of game for Bouchard because Coffey would typically make yes. the odd slack check. Yep. <clears throat> and he also and he also had an earlier up, turnover. Paul Cough up, they called him for a while. Bouchard had an earlier turnover where he tried to skate it out of his own zone and got the puck popped off his stick, and Evans got a really good shot then. Anyway, <clears throat> all's well that ends well for Evan Bouchard. My I have a lot thing. of forgiveness in my heart for whoever scores the game-winning goal. <laughs> yeah, I can't true. explain it, but it's always been there. Yeah. <laughs> um, my bad thing, Bruce, it, it, and it's not, it's not Evander Kane. It's his physical play, and I, it it's it's him it's him playing with injury. We've heard he's playing with injury, and can you ever tell? Can I ever? At least I see it. He just has a such a hard time maneuvering to get to win pucks, to steal pucks. His speed isn't there, and if it, I think it, we heard it's a groin injury. Uh, I just suffer one myself. I have a great deal of empathy for him. You can't move. You just don't have that explosiveness. I, I mean, I never have it, but Kane does. He's got. He's he's able. Usually, when Evander Kane is on, when he's bringing his A game, if nothing else, he is hitting people again and again and again. You know, five, six, seven, even eight hits a game. He didn't have any tonight, okay. and he's not able to hit because he just doesn't have. The closing speed and agility. You need agility to hit. Otherwise, you're going to be like Milan Lucic, you know, missing a lot of hits and ramming into the boards. And um, he's playing hurt. And I just, part of me just continues to wonder, why not give him 21, like put him on 20, you know, give him whatever time it takes for him to fully recover. Um now, we learned tonight that when Sam Gagne, everyone was thinking, why isn't Sam Gagne playing? Why doesn't he get back in the game? <clears throat> well, Ryan McLeod's out, and Sam Gagne couldn't go back in because evidently, reportedly, he's still banged up a bit. So maybe the reason Kane's playing is they, they're they short of NHL quality players right now, forwards, which is, and they need to win. And he's going to try to do everything he can to help them win. And, and he made some, in the end, he made some good plays. And... You know, he wasn't a, a terrible liability out there, but I just wonder if there's an opportunity at some point this year, if they can get a bit of a cushion, um, can you give this guy time off to get healthy? Because they could sure use a healthy Evander came in the playoffs. Yeah, they certainly could. So. Your number, Bruce. Well, they're getting there. Um uh... With these, all these wins, you know, they're now, their winning percentage, I think tonight will be just a tad over 600. Yeah. Oh, wow. 602 or something Sweet. like that. They got, they got um, uh, 20, 23, 15 and one. So uh, 47 points from 39 games. And so let me see, this isn't my number, but it's part of it. 603. Pretty good. Yeah, I'm just checking. Uh, yeah, they're tied. Seattle must have won tonight. They then. won their ninth straight tonight. So this is why they can't stop winning. Because <clears throat> Florida lost tonight. Winnipeg lost tonight. But Seattle and uh, Nashville. and, uh, and uh, Edmonton uh, both won. So anyway, my number is uh, uh, 17. Uh, which is the number of goals that the Oilers have given up during the 10-game winning streak, 17 goals against. And uh, they gave up three goals in each of the first two games before Christmas, 6-3 at New Jersey, 4-3 at New York Rangers. Remember that one in the last second? Yeah. And then since then, no team has scored more than two goals on Edmonton for the last eight straight games. Beat San Jose five nothing. They beat Kings three two in a shootout. They beat Ducks seven two. Philly five two. And all these last four games: three one, two one, three two in overtime, two one in overtime. And in particular, this three game road trip, where they gave up the first goal in each game, and only scored five regulation goals, and yet somehow 
found a way to win all three of these games. So just nail biters, one after another. I mean, even the game against Ottawa last Saturday was one as well. Uh, it was uh, uh, so credit to the defensive play, credit to the penalty kill, credit to the forwards who were coming back and uh, being effective for the most part, and huge credit to the two goaltenders who've been terrific. And the defensive game is, has come together. I mean, 17 goals in 10 games is a long stretch of defensive eliteness. Indeed. They really have been shutting them down. Um, the penalty kill has been really good, and uh, even strength has been outstanding. I mean, this isn't, they're not fluking off these wins. It's been <clears throat> some tough games against some weaker teams recently, some close games. But um, mm-hmm. Edmonton has been really cl- playing uh, excellent defense. We haven't seen, for instance, the slack check that I brought up earlier. We haven't seen a slack check in a while that those. comes to mind. So mm-hmm. that's good news. They're getting rid of that bad habit. Bruce, my number is, uh, so overall this year, Stuart Skinner in 29 games has a 903 save percentage, which I think is about the league average, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken. What's the last time I checked? He's been super duper hot for the last six weeks. He's the, I think he's about fourth overall for a save percentage in the last six weeks. Mm-hmm. But here's here's one for you. His 903 save percentage. If I told you that in January, just before the All-Star game, Stuart Skinner had a better save percentage than Igor Shosturkin, Jake Ottinger, UC Saros, and Andre Vasilevsky, what would you be thinking? Oh, I'd be thinking he'd be nine fifteen or something to be, yeah. you know, yeah. up there and with those guys. Uh, but as you say, the whole league average is dropping. It's nine oh three this year, which is the lowest it's been in eighteen years, and it's you know been consistently dropping one or two basis points a season now for almost a decade. Yeah. It was when McDavid broke in, it was 9.15. That was the peak. And from that year to now, it's down to 9.03. So a huge uh, uh, change. So streamlined equipment is some of it. It's funny how many no-name goalies are in the top 10 for save percentage, Bruce. Here's here's the top 10. Uh, I, and I'll just say the no-name goalies in the top 10. Charlie Lindgren, Joey Decord, Martin Jones, Anthony Stolarz, Laurent Brassois, Alex Lyon, and Jeremy Swayman. Relatively mm-hmm. unheralded goalies, and they're all in the top 10 right now. How many games have, have they all played, though? Well, they've those guys have all played at least 10. Right, Lindgren, okay. 16, Decord, 26, Martin Jones, 14, Stolarz, 11, Brassois, 11, Lyon, 14, Swayman, 22. So they're not up there in the twenties, most of them, except for Decord, right? <laughs> Who's really he, kicking? He's butt been for kicking butt Seattle. for Seattle, yeah. yeah. It's a weird so. position now, isn't it? You just don't know who he is. Aiden Hill, Stanley Cup winner, leads the league at nine thirty-three, though. And he's, he's only out. played fifteen. He's been games. out for weeks. Oh, okay, yeah. good. He came back and he played one game and he didn't make it to the first TV timeout and then he went off hurt again so he could be out for so lower body leg issue of some kind now they're Anyways, about Eichel Skinner during the um, during the win streak he's played 7 of the 10 and Picker to his credit played and won 3 games 7 0 and 0 of course uh, with a, a 951 save percentage during the win streak. During wow. the win streak, 951. And his goals against average in that span is somewhere around 140. He's looking good. You know, he <laughs> when he looks good, you know, he reminds me of his Connor Hallibuck. Um, they're both bigger guys, kind of solid, chunky guys. And I don't see Hallibuck as an acrobatic goalie either, but he is a goalie who just is always so solid on that first shot, except the odd shot by Darnell Nurse coming over the blue line in the third period. Mm-hmm. Um, but he is so solid, usually Hellebuck on that first shot, just a very strong positional goalie. 
And Skinner has a bit of that in him. So, um, but really, Bruce, I see this is his success is partly related to him, but the Oilers really have cut down on the ugly chances against, or, you know, the, the, the odd man rush chances. Montreal had none. I, I can't remember if Detroit or um, um, Chicago had any. They're, they're not giving up a lot of those odd man rush chances anymore. And that's a huge difference with the Oilers. They're back checking harder and playing smarter. Yeah, the odd coverage error, you know. Yes. Been, yeah. Where some guy gets a free shot from somewhere oh. because he got missed in the rotation somehow, but they're they're not it's there's not been a lot of those either. Like they've just been pretty sound and and the bottom six is pretty good at just sort of nothing happening while they're out there and the Top six has been scoring well, not right. Present time, just barely enough to uh, win them some games. <clears throat> yeah, McDavid hasn't been uh, since that big game like a week ago. Yeah, he's had four one-point games in a row. It's a slump for him. That is, but he he looks good, <laughs> so I'm not worried. Um, Montreal fans games, didn't seem to like him. They were booing him. They thought he took yeah. a dive, eh, or something. Is that it? Well. I yeah they after the orders I mean maybe we, this should have been our good thing the orders won a video review to, on the tying goal when they when they went my heart was in my throat I thought this is the only one they're going to get they better come. they had to win that <laughs> and yeah well I thought so but I mean you could look at it one way and say well Fogel went through the crease and the D man pushed him but not that hard and he hit, he bumped the goalie stick and oh, you barely. Know, yeah, I know, I know. I've seen some of these other calls, David. And, uh, you know, I've come away just with my head in my hands. But they won, uh, they won the, uh, uh, they won the challenge, which was uh, um, uh, a big, big part of this game. I mean, it was the only goal they got in regulation, the tying goal that uh, Drysaddle managed to, managed to push in. And then, uh, uh I mean, the power play finally delivered, but they didn't have, uh, you know, it's not like they're putting up big numbers on anybody just now, and they're still finding ways to win. So, Indeed. Um, Bruce, let's go to our conundrum. And yeah. um, it comes out of Columbus because Elvis Merzlikens, it's clear that the they're going to try to trade him. And it sounds like they're going to try to trade him soon. They've been going with two other goalies there. He's been the third goalie. He has a 907 save percentage this year, which is pretty good this year. And he has a career 906 save percentage. <clears throat> you'd think a goalie like that, well, you'd you know, be lots of suitors. But the problem is he's paid, he's had a couple crap years in a row before this bounce back year. Um, he's got a, a three more years on a contract that pays him 5.4 million. That's the real stumbling block. With the way goalies go up and down and the way Merzlikens has been down, um, he's not a good bet um, to be a solid goalie these next three years. He just isn't. So I think that their trade options are severely limited. Um, there's a few teams that are way below the cap that could take on that salary without taking all, giving Columbus a lot of salary back. Um, most of them don't need a goalie. Maybe Chicago, but they have Peter Morozik, who's playing pretty well. They might want to trade Morozik, though, to get something, um, get something in trade, and then they'd have Merce Leakins to cover. But there's not a lot of trade options. And the one that seems to come to mind is Edmonton's got a goalie who has a 909 career save percentage. Recently has been worse, much worse than Merce Leakins this season in, in Jack Campbell. But... The name sure does jump out at you as as a possible. If both teams just want to give their goalies two goalies that otherwise they can't move another start, restart their careers in a new city, um, it seems like it might be a trade that that would work for both teams. The Oilers would be rid of Campbell's contract. The Columbus would be rid of Merzlikens' contract, which they don't seem to want. What do you think? 
Well, they'd, they'd have a replacement boat anchor contract in each case, so they're not really rid of it. They just like Lucic for Neil, right? You change the name uh, on the top of the contract, but you still got the cap hit. Good comparison. But uh, Merzlikens is an NHL goalie. I would say it makes sense as a basis for a trade, but Edmonton would would clearly, in my view, have to add yeah. to make that, uh, make that work. How much and, do you think, Bruce? Uh, well, Jack... Campbell's in the minors and he's got 15 million left on his contract. You know, I I don't think that'd be cheap, but uh, you think they'd have to add, like, first draft pick? salary would look very likely, yeah, very likely. And Merzlikin says he wants to be a number one goalie, he considers himself a number one goalie. Well, right now, Edmonton's not really in the market for a number one goalie, in my opinion. I think they found their number one goalie within. And I'm not even sure they're in the market for a number two goalie at this moment, but we'll see. I think they've got their irons in a few fires and maybe something will come out. But Calvin Pickard's given them zero reason to say this guy is not good enough. So they, they, you know, Pickard's apparently a really good teammate. He's got a 902 save percentage, but if Skinner got hurt or was cold in the playoffs, anyway, well, would you rather have Merzlikens or would you have Calvin Pickard? Merzlikens has a better NHL track record. Yep. He so, does. and you'd also have gotten rid of the Campbell contract. So, Campbell. so uh, yeah, I would not want to go to Jack Campbell. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, so, I think if you were to give up a second round pick in Campbell for Merzlikens, for instance, to me that would be palatable. And you just you just make the offer and see if they're so desperate to move this player. And I listened to all of Merzlikens' interview. And you actually listen to the interview. Yeah, he he talks about wanting to be a starting goalie. He thinks he's, but he also says he's, he says I'm sure no third string goalie. Right. So I think yeah. he just wants to play in the NHL, not be a third string goalie. I don't know what's going on there, what's happened there, but he seems to have really fallen out of favor. Anyway, it's just. Um, it's interesting. I, I think Campbell in a second pick would be worth thinking about. Second round pick. A second round pick is a is a major coin, you know, major question mark whether that's going to ever be an NHL player. <clears throat> and getting rid of Campbell and having Merzlikens, in case Skinner does need relief in the playoffs, like he needed last year, and there was mm-hmm. some people thought Campbell was a good option. I never was that enthused with it, but Merzlikens, he has been a pretty like you know he's he, he and Campbell are very similar goalies Merzlikens is up right now Campbell was up at different times there are kind of up and down NHL goalies uh yeah I would I I could see the Oilers sweetening it a little bit not a first but a little bit they're going to need the first to make a trade I think they there's been a lot of talk about Edmonton needing a top six winger I haven't been too keen about that but I'm starting to warm up to that idea um, with Kane and Brown not looking like they're going to step up and be top six wingers this year. I'm thinking that might be the right idea because they might need McLeod at, th- at 3C. So you can either get a really top 3C and keep McLeod where he is, mm-hmm. or you can get a top six winger, uh, one or the other. Um, and it's going to be the first round pick will be the price for that. So um, I suspect Bruce, and um, I'm okay with that, but I wouldn't, I, I think they should consider this. I think it's a, an interesting idea. And, hey, it could win the Oilers of Stanley Cup. Like, I don't see Campbell this year turning it around. But Merzlikens right. has played well this year. And if if Skinner got hurt or got super cold, Merzlikens could come in and help you win some games in the playoffs. That could be huge. Yeah, I just can't see Columbus doing it without getting something back that's going to uh, it's likely to be a future because they're, you know, they're not a really good team right now. They got beat by Seattle tonight, 7-4. Not Merzlikens in that, but uh, Tarasov, the other guy. Yeah. But they, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're just one of these franchises that's been spinning its wheels forever. Seems what like. if it was like Borgo and Campbell for um, Merzlikens? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the kind of pot sweetening that would have to take place. And uh, if, you know. Because you've seen Bargo play. I haven't I, seen yeah. him play this year. Yeah. Uh, he's a ways away for sure. You know, you can see he's a, he's a player and he's a, uh, he's, 
he's looking to me more like an all-purpose player than any kind of uh, you know future superstar. Yeah, second year as a pro, like yeah, you would expect you would, you'd hope to see a, a big breakout. year year step up this year from him. I'm not sure if we've seen it. Anyway, maybe there's enough. Like I wouldn't think Broberg would be. I wouldn't do that trade. Obviously not. But um, wouldn't, no, or no. Holloway or somebody oh, like that. No. But. no, 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 no. But but you know, the first pick this year plus. Uh, not excuse me, not the first pick this year, but the second pick this year in the draft and Campbell, that would work for me or, or a <clears throat> prospect other than Broberg or Holloway would uh, probably work for me as well. So, yeah, but uh, looking at the Bakersfield game, they're leading two nothing in the just early in the second period tonight. Who's in that? After, uh, tonight it is Campbell's turn. I'm pretty sure I saw Campbell. Uh, Get a shout out, Jack. Yeah. I did, yeah. And he's got 13, Get a 13 saves so far. <clears throat> Good stuff. Good and stuff. Uh, Philip Broberg set up the first goal by Alex Peters. And uh, Raphael Lavoie got the second one from his line mates, Lane Peterson and Dylan Holloway on the power play. And those guys had a really good I watched the game last night, and those guys had a really good game. And Holloway looked really good last night. Seven shots on net. Uh, something like 14 and seven on the face off dot playing center and he was just flying all over well, the maybe place. he'll maybe it's still not too late for him to come back and step up he was headed kind of almost earning his way to the top six certainly on yeah. the third line he was looking real good and there was a chance he could be in the top six and so how and how is Broberg playing good liking his game a lot oh that's good to hear what do you, what do you like? Uh, well, he's he too is kind of an all-purpose player, you know. He's yeah. He he's such a good skater that he and he sure seems to show up in a good spot a lot. He made on the Holloway's what wound up being the winning goal on the power play last night, and Broberg made a beautiful pass from center point <clears throat> through the traffic, and he found uh, uh, Seth Griffith uh, at the. Uh, the kind of the face-off dot and then Griffiths fed a pass right through the goal mouth and Holloway got in close to the net down on one knee you know hard and heavy on a stick and jammed it into the net and both passes were sweet and uh, the one from Broberg like he had a few options and he picked the right one and he made a and it wasn't an obvious play and he made a really nice pass but he you know he uh, he made some strong plays in his own end of the ice as well. Like he's uh, in that league, he stands out. Well, it's where at least where he should be. I mean, he should probably be in the NHL by now. But the Oilers have a veteran blue line yep. with three really. Healthy, I mean, Nurse and Ekholm are potential All Star level players, and Brett Kulak is a pretty good. He's a pretty good third pairing D man. Um plays a similar game to Broberg in a lot of way. They're both really great skaters. And um, I think Broberg would be a similar kind of low event player um, if he made it to the NHL this year, which he still could, mm-hmm. obviously, if there's injury. Yeah, well, that's kind of, he's, he's the lady in waiting, so to speak, you know, for the opportunity to arise. And this is a year and a half where the Oilers' defense has just stayed uh, very healthy. And, they, you know, they, the same sextet starts game after game. Oh, a huge shout out tonight to Philip Kemp for making his NHL debut, such as it yeah. was. Defensive defenseman. Hey, Phil, we're going to put you in the lineup tonight at right wing, which he'd never played before in his life, I'm betting. And he got three early two. shifts, played two minutes and three seconds, and that was all he got. But he, he got, you know, his skate of honor the at the center bell. You know, I mean, it's pretty. Had to be a pretty thrilling. Well, he's a seventh round draft pick. Right? <laughs> yeah, you know, like he, they had two he, of them playing for him tonight. DeHarnay and Kemp. Yeah, they need DeHarnay back in Montreal. This, his, this uh, Max Weiner, he's going to man. He's he's playing with Broberg now. And how's Max looking? Good. Max, good, is. big, strong, uh, feisty, mean streak. He's. Uh, um, and he's still learning the game, so he makes he makes mistakes, 
but he, you know, he doesn't ever look overwhelmed. He's at least in the games I've seen, he just sometimes he gets beat. But he's a twenty-year-old kid playing against men. That's going to happen. Great to hear. Yeah. <laughs> the Oilers, if they're able to sign McDavid and Drysaddle again, are going to need, obviously, need a steady stream of cheaper yep. players coming up. And Wagner is uh, obviously one of the possibilities, along with Yasayev, and uh, who's still in Russia and. Um, not so many at forward, not so many young dudes at forward right, right now that are standing out. That's why I'm not anxious to trade any of them out. <clears throat> I hear <But>. you. <laughs> Fair enough. But you, they've got to do something with the Campbell contract, Bruce. This seems mm-hmm. like a, as good a bet as any. Um, like this would be a good, you know, maybe I'm going too much on recency bias with Mr. Leakins because because Campbell actually has outplayed him um, over time slightly. But um, a lot of that could be on which which team you're on. Columbus isn't known as a shutdown defensive team either, but they're they're similar goalies. So yeah, we'll see we'll see if that uh, comes to pass. All right, Bruce, uh, you got the game grades tonight. I do. Yeah, I'm just gonna fire them up now. So it'll be it'll be up in a while. So a shout out to Connor McDavid on his 27th birthday. His birthday present was getting roundly booed by the fans at Bell Center every time he touched the puck after uh, after Edmonton got their semi-disputed goal and uh, they got the power play because of the uh, because of the challenge and then during the power play McDavid took the puck hard to the net followed it into the blue paint did absolutely nothing in the blue paint but the refs decided uh, this is a good time for an even up call, so they called McDavid for goal <laughs> interference. That is one of the lamest, weakest, feeblest makeup calls I've seen in a long time. That call uh, was pure shite, <laughs> and McDavid was laughing the whole time he was in the penalty. He it was, was such a ridiculous what? call. What can you yeah. say? Like it was just. Uh-huh. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's what you could yeah. say. Yeah. And, uh, and the fan then he got hauled down behind the play, and I guess the fans decided he took a bu- dive or something because they booed him every was... time he touched the puck thereafter, which was about forty times that he got booed because the, the puck kept cycling through his stick. It really drew attention to how often he has it on his stick. And boo, boo. Montreal fans are so knowledgeable, <laughs> though I hear right, like they're so knowledgeable. Oh, they're passionate, David. They're yeah, they're partisan. They're passionate. Fans. Yeah, well, they're, yeah, who isn't? Yeah, yeah. They are in, in Edmonton. Myself, Bruce, so in Edmonton, I'm a I former try. Habs fan myself. Mm-hmm. I've said this before, and I'll and I'll say it again, and I will upset all the Habs fans, local Habs fans, of which there are many. They are when the Habs come to town, there is no more obnoxious outside uh, fans than the Habs fans in the Edmonton Arena. They are that team has had such great success in the distant, now distant past, but it seems to. I don't know. Anyway, probably said enough about that. <laughs> I remember going to an Oilers Habs game in 1981. Uh-huh. This was before the big playoff upset, but this was the game that set the stage for the playoff upset. And I was walk while I was walking from my car to the game. Some guy wearing a Habs jersey offered me a hundred dollars for my. I think it was a twelve dollar ticket at that time for my seat in the like lower bowl. Can you imagine $12? Uh, and I said, no. I said, uh, this ticket's worth a lot more to me than it is to you. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. You don't want to go to this game. I do. <laughs> and Edmonton waxed Montreal 9-1. This was the Vesna Trophy winning Montreal Canadiens. And Gretzky had a goal and four assists and just owned the ha- the mighty Habs. Uh, that won the Vesna Trophy by 17 goals that year, but they sure didn't win it on that night. And that was the d- night I walked out of the arena and I said to myself, Wayne Gretzky's the greatest hockey player of all time. You might as well enjoy him. He just literally just turned 20 years old. Was it? What was the year, just to, to relive um, those great times a little bit, mm-hmm. the year that they beat the Habs in the playoffs? 81. 81. Yeah. Bruce, that was, of all the moments... Of Fantastic. being an Oilers fan <laughs> in that era, sir, it's probably other than winning the cup for the first time. Mm-hmm. To me, that moment, mm-hmm. you know, I was a passionate Habs fan in the 1970s to the point where I didn't know who I was going to cheer for when the Oilers first played the Habs. I and, and then it was obvious I was cheering for the Oilers, but right. 
they, they it was such an amazing thing for our mm-hmm. Oilers to, to join the NHL, to go up against the Montreal Canadiens that still had Robinson on the floor, and to just hand it to them, to dominate those games. And what I remember so well from those games is it seemed like there was five Gretzkys on the ice. Mm-hmm. All the Oilers had been learning from Wayne Gretzky, watching him in practice, and they had raised their games. They had raised their hockey IQ and their passing. So players like Hagman and Messier were making incredible passes in that mm-hmm. game. And and the owners just dismantled. They were way better than the Montreal Canadiens. And it was such it was it was shocking. It was shocking how fast it happened. And it was spectacular to behold. Yeah, well, what I'll remember about that series is I'm starting in the Montreal forum and the, and Danny Gallivan saying before the first game, talking about the 22 Stanley Cup banners uh, that were hanging over the forum ice. And maybe it was Dick Irvin, or it's probably maybe just me noticing that the Oilers had seven players in their uh, lineup that weren't even 22 years old, right? They had Andy Moog, who was 21, Kevin Lowe, who was 21, uh, Paul Coffey, who was still 19, and then they had four 20-year-old forwards, Wayne Gretzky, Yari Curry, Mark Messier, and Glenn Anderson. Almost all those guys wound up in the Hall of Fame, except for Moog. All the other guys wound up in the Hall of Fame. So here you have on the one, to- all of this, you know, banners everywhere, all these retired sweaters, all these greats, you know, Jean Beliveau sitting behind the bench <laughs> watching the game. And, uh, and the orders just came and skated rings around them. It was incredible. And uh, it was really was the changing of the guard right before our <laughs> eyes. And I think this it. Oilers team would match mm-hmm. up against the Oilers of, of that era. Well, give them wood sticks and Micron skates and uh, Yofa helmets. And uh, that would, that would uh, <laughs> <laughs> level the tables quick. Uh, I mean, I think 40 years of advancement in defensive systems and such. It's I, impossible I, you know, to compare them because the skill level it's two different skill eras. Level dramatically increased from all the players. Like it's just, you know, mm-hmm. Ryan McLeod today, if you could somehow transport him back, would just be so fast for that league. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just, yeah. the players are faster, they're bigger, they're more skilled now. So you can't really make the comparison. It's not really possible. Yeah, they're more disciplined and, and schooled. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the, that Oilers team was so entirely creative. And that, you know, I mean, relative to their peers, they were phenomenal skaters. And when they got the puck on the string, you know, there was only one place where it was going to wind up, and that was the back of the net. They were the greatest <laughs> attacking team the NHL has ever seen. Yeah, well, and the numbers certainly backed that up they, all the they way. They really were. They really were. Bruce, yeah. let's uh, leave it there tonight. Oh, it's nice to beat the Habs, isn't it? Even if it's two to one and a freezing that. cold January yeah. night. I hate that team. Yeah, good to see them lose. (laughs) All right, Bruce, thanks for talking tonight. All right, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. Stay warm, everybody.